Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 11 Chapter 11 The ship collided. On the cabin Logan paintbrush slip and make a scratch on the paper. What is Luffy doing Logan said. Logan then put his brush on his inventory, checking out his stat he see the improvement on speed and defense attribute. He checked the system log classification interface again, and there was nothing in it. But, what Logan didn't notice was that in the drop-down box of the log category interface, there was a finer division, including a system email category. This email interface was updated with an email today. Your manga fan Monkey D. Luffy has improved his strength in the world of the manga, Akam Gak Kill, and the development of his fruit has reached the second level. You simultaneously obtain the second gear ability of its fruit. Receive it while waiting for the host to check the mail. Your manga fan Monkey D. Luffy has improved his strength in the world of the manga, Akam Gak Kill, and the development of his fruit has reached the third level. You simultaneously obtain the third gear ability of its fruit. Receive it while waiting for the host to check the mail. The boat is moving, isn't Luffy demolishing the ship? After thinking for a while, Lugan turned off the system interface and walked outside. On deck Tilda. Luffy looked at a group of uninvited guests who came up, and tilted his head. Are you trying to rob? Boy, you're smart. Jump off here, this boat belongs to the most beautiful woman in East Blue. A pirate pointing a sword at Luffy arrogantly, ordered. The most beautiful woman in East Blue? This time, Luffy was even more confused. He swayed his head from side to side and searched for a while, where is it? Why didn't I see it? Bastard, blind your dog eyes. Ms. Alveda, the most beautiful woman in East Blue, is standing right in front of you, and you can't see it? Stupid, this is the most beautiful woman in East Blue. Luffy squinted his eyes, studying the burly pirate who claimed to be the most beautiful woman in East Blue. He scratched his head, looking genuinely puzzled. Although Luffy may seem carefree, his logical thinking is sound. He understands the underlying intentions of those around him. Pointing at Alvido incredulously, he remarked, Is this the savage aunt you're referring to? What a shock. The pirate's eyes widened, and their jaws dropped simultaneously. Wild, savage aunt. This. After the initial shock, fear gripped their hearts. If they were to be entangled in Alvido's fury, it would be a perilous situation. The atmosphere on the entire deck suddenly turned gloomy, and the temperature seemed to drop a few degrees out of thin air. Alvida was known to be touchy, and crossing her path usually led to dear consequences. You little brat, face your doom. With an enraged expression on her plump face, Alvida raised her mace without hesitation, aiming it at Luffy's head. Calling this beauty an aunt? Well, this aunt was about to show him his own brains. Boom. The mace descended heavily on Luffy's head, but instead of witnessing brain matter, Alvida was met with Luffy's smile. What? Hee hee, that won't work on me, because I'm made of rubber. Under the brim of his straw hat, Luffy's wide grin was revealed. Now it's my turn. Luffy rubbed his shoulders, extending his arms backward. Then, to the astonishment of everyone, he shot towards Alvida's stomach like a cannonball. You know, in the original comics, even a newly seafaring Luffy could send Alvida flying. And now, this is Luffy, who has undergone a power-up. Although he refrained from using second gear, let's not overlook the fact that his Haki prototype has also been enhanced. Even if it hasn't materialized as armament Haki yet, the prototype of Haki has undoubtedly elevated his strength. With a single punch, Alvida's eyeballs were on the verge of popping out. The next moment. Boom. Under the tremendous force, her colossal body soared into the sky, tracing a beautiful trajectory before disappearing from everyone's sight. What? The hand. His hand transformed. Miss Alvida was sent flying. His devil fruit power. The henchmen who had relied on Alvida's faux authority now wore terrified expressions. They quickly dropped to their knees, pleading for mercy. Boom. 
The hatch swung open, and Logan emerged. Huh? What's going on? Initially thinking it was Luffy demolishing the ship, Logan was surprised to find the deck so lively. Glancing at the sky, Laran pondered, did something just get thrown out? The pirate's faces twitched involuntarily. Huh? Logan, you're out? Luffy rubbed his fists, a cheerful smile on his face. These guys tried to rob us, so I took care of their boss. Forgive us. We were coerced. Please spare us, we'll never turn to piracy again. Once again, the pirates pleaded for mercy. Okay, get lost. Luffy had no grandiose plans, as long as they didn't bother him, he didn't mind. Ah, thank you, brother. Thank you for your mercy. Let's go now. Wait a moment. At this point, Logan's words once again raised the anxiety levels of the pirates. He extended two fingers. Firstly, considering it was a skirmish on a pirate ship, you're free to leave, and all the treasures aboard are yours to keep. Secondly, we need someone knowledgeable about sailing to guide us to the next island. While Luffy exuded the aura of a protagonist, depending solely on him for navigation seemed a bit unreliable. As for Logan. Well, that was out of the question. Now that they had encountered someone who could help, it was the perfect opportunity to address this issue. With Sora waiting at the next destination, the journey could unfold according to the original plot. Logger had no interest in deviating from the established narrative, he just wanted a smooth ride. Me, I know a bit about sailing. Exclaimed a small man from the crowd. He had a parted head and glasses, and his shout seemed to summon the courage of several lifetimes. Captured by the pirates and relegated to the role of a ship's handyman, he had long yearned for escape. However, under the oppressive shadow of Alveda, he lacked the courage to break free. Now, witnessing Alveda being blown away before his eyes, he understood that if he didn't seize this chance, he might never be free. Okay, it's you, Logan nodded, pleased to see the volunteer was Kobe. In the original comic plot, Luffy reached Shell's town with Kobe's navigation. However, due to Logan's interference, Luffy missed meeting Kobe, and as a result, both Logan and Luffy found themselves adrift at sea. With Kobe's appearance now, it was clear that the plot was getting back on track. Comfortable. Everything was back to normal, and Logan could continue to lie down in peace. Chapter 12, Chapter 12 after transferring all the treasures onto Logan's boat, Alveda's minion sailed away hastily, as if fleeing. Thank you so much, Kobe kowtowed on the deck to Logan and Luffy, expressing his gratitude. Only when it was confirmed that Alveda's ship had truly departed did Kobe allow himself to relax a bit. What are you doing, Tilda? Luffy wore a puzzled expression, his face adorned with question marks. You are my saviors. Thanks to meeting you, I can escape from Alveda's shadow. Kobe looked up at Luffy, his face adorned with a grateful and flattering smile. Luffy, even more confused, scratched his head. Since you don't want to stay with her, why not find a chance to escape? Run away. Run away? No. 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 Impossible. No way. Every time I think of Ms. Alveda's mace, my. My. My legs go limp. Some horrifying memories seem to resurface, causing Kobe, who had been communicating normally, to even stutter. His head was dripping with sweat, and his expression conveyed horror. Ah. It's terrible. Kobe was in a state of panic. Observing Kobe's reaction, Luffy placed his hands on his hips and, with a sincere smile, remarked, Well, you are really stupid and useless, and you are also cowardly. Kobe's face turned into a display of distress. Why, oh why did you smile so sincerely while saying such hurtful things? Yes, cowardly people have no future. Kobe, don't you have any dream? Logan interjected. Dream. Kobe hesitated, his gaze drifting toward the pirate flag hanging on the mast. Don't even dare to say your own dream? Then you are really coward. Logan rested his chin and shook his head with a hint of resentment. Having known from the mangas that Kobe was cowardly, witnessing it firsthand made Logan realize that using the term cowardly to describe Kobe might be an understatement. It was like trying to build a wall with mud that couldn't support it. Logan's words seemed to touch a nerve in Kobe, awakening his last semblance of courage. Huh. Kobe took a deep breath, clenched his fist vigorously, a self-deprecating smile suddenly appeared on his face, and he said bitterly, Can someone like me join the Marines? Marines? Luffy froze for a moment. Yes, although I will become enemies with you, as a Marine, I will become stronger and catch all the bad guys. Speaking with newfound determination, Kobe, 
teary-eyed and sweating, shouted at the two people in front of him with an aura he had never used before. This has been my dream since I was a child. Look. It's actually not that difficult to shout out your dreams, huh? Logan walked up to Kobe, smiled, and patted his shoulder. Huh. Yeah, I feel much happier when I say it. The fear of Alveda in my heart seems to be reduced. Kobe felt that his breathing became smoother. Actually, if you have the courage, it is not difficult to realize your dreams. If I remember correctly, the marine base closest to here should be in Shell's town. When you get there, join the marines. More than half of your dream have been realized. As for the next road, it depends on you. Good luck with a character like Kobe, Logan had no intention of recruiting him into the group. Moreover, recruiting members into the team was the captain's decision. If there were no special circumstances, Logan did not want to deviate from the plot direction. If one element went awry, it could trigger a butterfly effect, and the straw hats might not be as cool as expected, impacting Logan as well. Really? Not long ago, he was a slave on Alveda's ship, and now he was on the verge of realizing his dream? Kobe couldn't believe this fact. But upon reflection. Yes. Shell's town was not far from here, and once he arrived there, joining the marines meant he no longer had to worry about Alveda chasing him. You are right Logan. Thank you for the encouragement Kobe's confidence increased, but the next moment his face showed worry again. But, are you willing to take me to Shell's town? Logan shrugged. As long as you can navigate this ship to Shell's town, we will get you there. I'm not going to lie, we're both sailing idiots. Hearing this, Kobe was excited, no problem, this voyage is on me. In the control cabin, Kobe carefully observed the ocean current while steering the ship. I found it. It's this ocean current. As long as you go straight along this stream, you will soon reach Shell's town. After confirming the course, Kobe fixed the rudder. No further action was required until reaching the port. I wonder what Luffy and Logan are up to? With nothing to control for the time being, Kobe immediately thought of Luffy and Logan. After all, they were the first good guys he had encountered since growing up. Upon reaching the deck, he saw Luffy looking at something. Ah, damn it. Can't defeat that guy. I'll try again. Hey? I just remembered, it was the last chance for today. Ah. It seems we'll have to wait until tomorrow. Luffy yelled in frustration. Luffy, are you reading mangas? Kobe moved closer, his eyes falling on the manga book in Luffy's hand. A little curious, he cautiously asked, can you let me see it? That won't work. I still need this manga for important things. If you lose it, I'll be in trouble. Luffy waved his hand and refused directly. Oh. Kobe didn't dare say anything more. About to leave timidly, he heard Luffy's hearty voice, but, if you want to read mangas, you can go to Logan. He has drawn a lot of mangas, there must be something you like. Is this drawn by Logan? Of course. He's a mangaka. Really? Logan is amazing. Well, you don't need to say this. Go, I will take you to him. With that said, Luffy took Kobe and entered the cabin. Soon, the two arrived at Logan's studio. Luffy? Pausing the paintbrush in his hand, Logan said suspiciously, You don't think you want another manga, do you? Hasn't a copy of, Akame Gak Kill, cut off your interest yet? Luffy shook his head, Ah no. It's Kobe. He also wants to read mangas, so I brought him to you. So that's the way it is. Kobe, you can choose one yourself. Logan readily agreed. As a mangaka, Logan felt proud when more people read his mangas. While Logan had prevented Luffy from coming to his studio to avoid any potential destruction, it was not because he didn't want to share his mangas with Luffy. Ah, thank you, thank you. Kobe was very grateful. When he reached the bookshelf, he didn't dare to take too long, selecting one at random and quickly returning. Oh, that's right. Kobe, this manga is for you. Seeing Luffy and Kobe leaving, Logan suddenly realized that he would soon part ways with Kobe when they reached Shell's town. Although Kobe's character was not the most pleasing, his interest in Logan's mangas hinted at a shared vision. It's just a manga, a parting gift. Upon hearing this, Kobe was deeply moved. He hadn't received a gift from others since childhood, and now he was not only rescued by Logan but also given a manga. Thank you, Logan. I promise I will cherish this manga. In his heart, Kobe had so much to express. This is a symbol of our friendship. Yet, he couldn't articulate it, fearing that he wasn't worthy of discussing friendship with Logan. But no matter what his thoughts, Kobe, in his heart, would always remember Logan's kindness. Chapter 13, Chapter 13 
Upon entering the cabin, Kobe carefully retrieved the manga book cradled in his arms. Book title, Demon Slayer, Zenitsu. After perusing the first episode, Kobe was captivated. He discovered that the protagonist, shared a striking resemblance to him in character, both timid and reserved. Wow, no. I thought Zenitsu was as timid as me. Unexpectedly, he's even more timid than me. Ahahaha. He's so cute. If he wasn't a character in the mangas, I would definitely be able to become good friends with him. Chuckling heartily, Kobe continued reading. Bastards, these guys actually bully girls? It's over, it's over, the coward Zenitsu is the only one around these two girls. Observing the manga's plot, Kobe felt uneasy. He knew that if it were him, he definitely wouldn't dare to make a move. What's more, Zenitsu was even more timid than him. Anticipating a miserable fate for the two girls in the next chapter, Kobe turned to the next page. However, the image on the next page left Kobe in shock. Nah, nanny? Kobe couldn't believe that the boy, who was evidently more cowardly than him, had actually stood up. He fought desperately with the bad guys, and despite being covered in bruises, he was finally knocked out. But he stood up. Kobe felt his cheeks burn hot. Just moments ago, he thought Zenitsu was more cowardly than him. But now, Zenitsu slapped Kobe hard with his actual actions. Made him understand. Zenitsu is a pure man. And the clown is only me. Kobe was in a state of depression for a long time before continuing to read. Then he saw the former Thunder Hashira Jogura Kawajima accepted him as his apprentice. Kobe's A's showed envy. How wonderful it would be if I could meet such a person Tilda. Crash. Or. The howling of wild wolves resounded in his ears. The lingering mountain wind violently slapped Kobe's face, and the sensation was incredibly vivid. What? How? What happened? Momentarily bewildered, Kobe looked around. When he saw Zenitsu practicing in the cold wind and Jigura Kawajima standing aside, carefully guiding him, he was completely stunned. Zen. Zenitsu. Rubbing his eyes vigorously, Kobe thought he was hallucinating. Then he slapped himself again. The hallucinations haven't gone away. No, this is not an illusion. Who are you? Jigura Kawajima looked at Kobe, a little surprised. After all, he is the former Hashira of the Demon Slayer Corp. He is strong, needless to say. However, when the little guy in front of him appeared, he didn't feel anything before. It is a good seedling. I, 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 I. My name is Kobe. Suddenly encountering this situation, Kobe panicked even more. Little guy, what are you doing here? Jigura Kawajima became interested in Kobe and walked over slowly. He looked at Kobe's fearful and cowardly look. Wasn't he carved out of the same mold as Zenitsu? Moreover, to be able to follow here without the old man noticing, this is a talent. Do, do. Yeah, what am I doing here? Ah, no, I have no idea how I got here. Kobe was full of fear, not knowing what to say. Hey, do you also want to learn? At this time, Zenitsu asked curiously. Apart from wanting to learn, I really can't think of any other reason for being able to follow this deep into the mountain. Assassination? Stop it. Looking at it like this, you can tell it's impossible at a glance. Ah Tilda, learn? Hearing what Zenitsu said, Kobe was taken aback for a moment. But then, a strong desire welled up in his heart. Yes. How wonderful it would be if I could also learn from this old man. I, can I do it too? The lack of self-confidence from the inside out was evident on his face. Little guy, as long as you want to learn, of course, you can. Jigura Kawajima came to Kobe, with a kind smile on his face, and he stretched out his hand to Kobe. Would you like to be my apprentice? Ah, I wish. I am willing. So flattered that Kobe's heart almost jumped out of his throat. Ah ha ha ha, this is really good. Jigura Kawajima pulled Kobe up, and he was in a great mood. Zenitsu also ran over, ha ha, let me introduce myself, my name is Zenitsu, and I am your senior brother. Well, my name is Kobe. Thank you. Feeling the warmth of being valued by others, Kobe's tears flowed down immediately. Chapter 14 Chapter 14 The next day Tilda. Luffy got up early and went to the deck, stretched his waist, and planned to enter the world of, Akamgakil. But at this moment, Kobe's shout came, here we are. We have arrived at Shell's town. Have we arrived? Let me see. Luffy stretched out his hand to build a pergola in front of his eyes and looked towards the bow of the ship. Sure enough, the silhouette of an island had appeared ahead. Great. The pirate hunter you mentioned is here, right? 
When chatting with Kobe yesterday, Luffy learned that in this sea, there is a powerful swordsman named Rora Noazora, who is a bounty hunter by profession and specializes in catching pirates in exchange for bounties. Upon learning about such a formidable character, Luffy's immediate reaction was. This person, I want him on my crew. If he hadn't escaped, he must still be there. While on Alveda's ship, Kobe read in a newspaper that Rora Noazora had been captured by Shell's town marine. It should have been several days. Great. I can't wait. Rubbing his hands together, Luffy was excited. Suddenly, he turned his head to look at Kobe, tilting his head. You seem to have become more confident. When a person changes, the most undisguised thing is their confidence. Luffy could tell right away. Ah, Tilda? Kobe chuckled and then said calmly, Well, Luffy, do you know? I encountered a very miraculous thing. I actually got into the manga book that Logan gave me yesterday. I met two people inside, and even worshipped one of the old grandfathers as my teacher. There is also a young man who is as timid and cowardly as me. He is my senior brother. I feel that I have a very similar personality with him. Thinking of the adventure he had while reading mangas yesterday, Kobe's words flowed like a torrential river. Suddenly, he realized that he seemed to have been talking for a long time and stopped immediately. I know, it must be difficult for you to believe what I said, but this is what really happened. Ah ha ha I believe what you said, because I also entered the manga world. What? Did you go into? Of course, this is a manga drawn by Logan. Of course, you can enter it, Luffy explained, relying on his own imagination. Kobe suddenly realized, is this so? So, Logan actually knows that we have entered the manga world? That's for sure. Luffy seemed to have figured everything out. He patted Kobe on the shoulder and said, Logan is a powerful man. His manga has magical powers, I think he made this manga for me, it's just tailor made for me. Exactly. As if he had found a confidant all of a sudden, Kobe nodded again and again. Yes, this manga book I took is also super suitable for me. It is just specially drawn for me. To tell you the truth, I was still thinking about whether to ask Logan about it. No use it. Luffy understood again. With his hands on his hips, he looked like he was pointing out, let me tell you. I've already done what you want to do. As a result Tilda, before I even open my mouth, Logan knew everything. So, you asking will only delay his drawing time. Ahaha ah, yes. I'm so stupid. Since Logan's manga has such a magical ability, how could he not know about it? I'm really grateful to him. Kobe scratched his head and said embarrassedly. Then, he turned his head to look towards the bow of the ship, and the island was already in front of him. Here we are, do you want to call Logan to get off the boat together? That's a must. Luffy took a stride, loosened his muscles, and rushed into the cabin with a whoosh. Is this the island where Shell's town is located Tilda? Called out by Luffy, Logan stood at the bow of the boat and looked at the coastline that was getting closer and closer. Speaking of which, it's a bit sad. It has been a year since his travel, and this is the first time Logan has seen the land of the pirate world. The tall croaking tree and the huge marine base, which belonged to the unique landscape style of the One Piece world, suddenly rushed forward Tilda. I have to say that Logan likes this style very much. Marine Base East Blue Sub Base, Branch 153 is located on this island. What do you hear? Here is the marine base, which represents justice, so the lives of the people should be very healthy. But in fact Tilda. As the base commander of this base, Captain Morgan, is a guy who was once killed the captain of the Black Cat Pirates, Kuro. In a marine conflict between marine and pirate, Morgan became the only survivor. Kuro uses his partner hypnosis technique to Morgan, so that Kuro can escape from and become a dead man. As for Morgan. Killing the pirate Kuro he got promoted to the base chief of section 153. Then began his tyranny over this place. Not only are the civilians on the entire island living under the shadow of his rule, but even the marine soldiers are worried every day because if they don't pay attention, they may be hacked and killed by Morgan at will. According to Kobe's information, Zara should be locked in the marine base at this time. Let's go. Find that man named Rora Noah Zora. Luffy grinned and jumped off the boat first. Come on, let's get off the boat too. Logan said, and walked down the string bridge. Kobe followed suit. Chapter 15, Chapter 15 After setting foot on the ground of Shell's town, the three of them first went to fill their stomachs and then came to the vicinity of Branch 153. Logan looked up at the tall marine base building. 
The body of the building is like a bunker, with green camouflage, stripes and cannons on the top, which seems to be full of a strong sense of oppression. Since the pirate hunter named Zora has been caught here, I'll climb up to have a look first. Walking to the wall, Luffy reached out his hand. Whoosh! The attributes of the rubber man allowed him to climb up the wall immediately. Hey Tilda? I seem to have found it. As soon as he got on the wall, Luffy let out a surprise, and then he stretched out his hands and pulled Logan and Kobe up. Three people sat in a row on the wall. What? Kobe wasn't ready yet, and when he caught sight of the man in the middle of the square, he uttered a horrified cry and fell off the wall. Luffy looked confused. What's the matter, Kobe? Black, black hood, green girdle, really, really roar a Noah Zora. Okay, so intimidating. Then, that's Zora. Although Kobe's strength has improved somewhat, he has not reached the level of transformation after all. The moment he saw Zora's face clearly, the cowardice in his heart was aroused again. Is he really the pirate hunter Zora you mentioned? But it seems that the rope is easy to break. Luffy became more and more puzzled. Isn't it said that Zora is a devilish pirate hunter? How could he be tied up with such a thin rope and be helpless? Don't be kidding. If you let that guy escape, not only will the people in the town be in bad situation, but even you will be killed. Kobe still knows Shell's town very well, and he knows how terrifying Captain Morgan is. But at this moment, Zora, who was tied to the cross, raised his head. Hey, boy over there, come and help me. Untie this rope, please. I have been tied for nine days, and I am too tired gone. Speak, speak. Kobe, who had just climbed up again, shrank his head subconsciously when he heard Zora's words. Look, that guy's smiling. Luffy sat with his legs up and his legs up, watching curiously with his chin resting on his hands. Luffy, didn't you say you wanted to invite him to the crew? Why don't you go over there? Logan reminded. Luffy remained unmoved. Kobe said he was a big devil, so I haven't figured it out yet. Just as he was talking, a wooden ladder leaned against the wall next to the three of them. Then a little girl climbed up. S-H-H. The little girl made a silent gesture to the three, and then slid down the fence. Kobe shouted nervously, Hey, hey. What is she going to do? Get close to that person and she will be killed. I don't think so. Logan said with certainty. Why? Luffy turned his head and asked curiously. Logan shrugged, As you know, I am a mangaka, so my ability to associate is very strong. Judging from this scene, I guess this little girl is here to repay her kindness. Repaying kindness? Impossible? Kobe looked suspicious. That is the pirate hunter known as the devil. What kindness could he do to a little girl? Don't believe me? Then let's ask. With that said, Logan jumped off the fence and followed the little girl towards Zora. Although he has no output, his speed and defense are ridiculously high. There is nothing to say about self-preservation ability. R, do you want to go in? Seeing Logan go in, Kobe was immediately deserted. Hey hey, Luffy, why don't you? Seeing that Luffy followed suit, Kobe almost cried. He looked left and right, finally mustered up the courage, and followed. You are looking for death, brat. Get out of here. Zora glanced at the little girl who came to him, and said fiercely. However, the little girl seemed indifferent to his fake ruthlessness. Her dark eyes were full of light. I made rice balls for you. Big Brother has been tied up all the time, he must be very hungry. I said I'm not hungry. Hurry up and take the things away. Zora yelled again. Luffy's face became gloomy, and he rubbed his arms. I want to punch someone now. Wait. Don't you want to ask why this little girl brought Zora food first? Logan grabbed Luffy's face and pulled him back. It seems reasonable. Certainly. Here's a revised version of the conversation. Luffy paused, eyeing the little girl. Why are you giving him rice balls? Don't blame him. Big Brother is actually a good guy, the girl explained eagerly. She launched into an incessant explanation. About ten days prior, a wolf raised by Captain Morgan's bully son, Helmepo, had nearly bitten the little girl. Zora swooped in, dispatching the wolf and confronting Helmepo. Initially, Zora could have departed, but Helmepo had threatened retaliation against the little girl's family if he left. To resolve the situation, Zora struck a deal. He would willingly be tied to a cross for a month in exchange for absolving the issue. Nanny? Luffy's anger dissipated upon understanding the truth. He approached Zora. Hey, kid. Why the stare? Zora's gaze remained intense. Luffy faced Zora, boldly declaring, Hey, I'm Luffy. 
I'll untie you and you can join me as my crew. Ah Tilda? Luffy. He's a notorious devil. Kobe interjected, alarmed by Luffy's directness. Read ahead at Patreon slash Golden Garuda. Chapter 16. Chapter 16. Hatilda? Pirates? Zoro expressed surprise. Please, I won't stoop to becoming a pirate. Zoro immediately refused the offer to join the pirates. What's wrong with being a pirate? It's my dream. Luffy spread his hands, changing the subject. Besides, being labeled a villain doesn't change much. I'm not like you. You can find someone else. Even if you don't help me untie the rope, I'll manage as long as I stay here for a month, Zora stated firmly, shaking his head. In Zora's view, pirates were despicable, a belief reinforced by his encounters with many of them. <laughs> Luffy rubbed his chin in contemplation. This seems a bit tricky to handle. Why can't it be more like Logan? Luffy pondered. Suddenly, thoughts of Logan crossed Luffy's mind. Luffy, just don't bother him about it. It's hard to convince idiot like him. Logan said. Those words triggered an immediate response from Zora. Hey, what did that jerk say about me? Yeah? Logan, how did you figure out he is an idiot? Luffy chimed in, also curious. Didn't he just say that? He's trusting Helmet Poten honor his word after threatening innocent lives? That's just idiotic, Logan calmly explained. After contemplating for a moment, Luffy nodded in agreement. Exactly. Anyone who can use innocent lives as leverage can't be trusted to keep his promise. Hearing their words, Zora's heart raced. It seemed increasingly true. Yet, having endured for nine days, Zora remained steadfast, refusing to admit he'd made a foolish decision. No way. I struck a deal with him. If I don't endure these thirty days, he will let me go, Zora stubbornly insisted. Hey, what a lively scene. A dapper young man with bobbed hair entered the square with a few marine soldiers. Don't you dare move, the man commanded. Have you seen this sign? He gestured to a notice board. It clearly states that anyone aiding the prisoner will be treated as an accomplice. Pointing at the little girl, he added with a smug smile, even the little girl. Logan glanced back. Ah, perfect. The captain foolish son has arrived to stir things up. He spoke up, addressing Helmetpo. Hey, Helmetpo. You never intended to let Zora go from the start, did you? Huh? How dare you speak to a young master in such a manner? Helmetpo's frown deepened as he glared at Logan. Then, a maniacal grin crept across his face. Ha ha ha. But you're right. This fool believed my lies and willingly remained tied up in this square for nine days. In truth, I plan to execute him in three days, just before he starved to death. I want him to understand the consequences of crossing a young master like me. And now, there's you, talking to him, that is a capital offense. Boom. Luffy's fist collided with Helmet Poe's face, causing several of his teeth to scatter through the air. Withdrawing his fist, Luffy placed his hands on his hips and gazed at Helmet Poe lying on the ground. Logan was right. You've been deceiving Zora from the start. Zora's eyes widened in surprise. Helmet Poe shook his head, the stars in front of him gradually fading away. He groaned and managed to form words, shouting in shock and anger, Ah! How dare you hit me! Kill them! Several marine soldiers raised their guns, but Luffy's swift punches knocked them to the ground. Helmet Poe was dumbfounded, then he fiercely threatened, I'll tell my dad, you're all dead. Snapped. Stepping down with one foot, Logan stepped on all of Helmet Poe's facial features together, not Luffy this time, but Logan himself. Approaching Helmet Poe, Logan knelt down slowly, observing the bleeding Helmet Poe in front of him. He pointed at Helmet Poe and spoke flatly. Why are you bringing your father in front of someone like Luffy? Wait, Logan, don't act trashly. His father is Captain Morgan, the most influential figure in Shell's town, Kobe intervened, restraining Logan from escalating the situation. Hearing Kobe's words, Helmet Poe became increasingly terrified. That's right. My father is a captain in the Marines. He's the supreme authority in all of Shell's town. You're finished. Logan glanced at Helmet Poe with a tinge of sympathy, shaking his head slightly. You, you're a frog in a well. Just because your father is a mere marine captain doesn't make you all powerful, Logan retorted, uninterested in explaining anything further. He then raised his head and swiftly knocked Helmet Poe unconscious with a punch. Chapter 17, Chapter 17 You guys are pretty gutsy. You know, if you weren't pirates, I might like you a bit. Zora's perspective on Luffy and Logan began to shift as he watched them take down Helmet Poe one after another. 
but he still couldn't shake off his deep-rooted reservations about pirates. It felt like a pig butcher who had spent years slaughtering pigs suddenly being asked by a pig to be its crew. Would the butcher agree? However, this time, Zara encountered a persistent pig. I like you too. Join me as my crew. Luffy invited Zora once again, uninterrupted by Helmepo's protests. I have my own path to follow. I'm not interested in becoming a pirate and being a villain. Zora firmly declined. I've never strayed from my beliefs, and I won't in the future. I don't care. I've already decided that you'll be my crew. Luffy seemed innocuous. Zora felt a mix of confusion and frustration. Hey, stop deciding on your own. By the way, I heard you're skilled with sword, Luffy calmly asked, seemingly oblivious to Zora's exasperation. Yes, I truly would have shown you. If I hadn't been tied up, Zora lamented. What about your sword? Luffy inquired. That bastard took it, Zora gestured towards the grounded helmet pool. Recalling his sensei and Kuina, Zora gritted his teeth. That sword is as precious to me as life itself. Oh, that's important. Luffy's face lit up with a mischievous grin. All right, I'll help you retrieve the sword from that guy. Thank you. I'll remember this favor, Zara acknowledged gratefully. Zara nodded, thankful that Luffy was helping with his sword situation. Luffy grabbed Helmepo from the ground and raised him up. Crackling sounds filled the air as Helmepo slowly regained consciousness amidst a burst of crisp, melodic applause. Hey, did you take Zara's sword? Luffy questioned. Huh. Helmepo paused, then nodded groggily. I did take it. Great. Take me to where the sword is. Without hesitation, Luffy sprinted towards the marine base, dragging Helmepo along. Oh, and remember, if you want the sword, you have to be my crew. Luffy shouted back at Zara before dashing off. Hearing this, Zara was stunned for a moment before his features twisted in disbelief. Hey, that's so underhanded. Since you agreed, I'm off. Luffy yelled without looking back, disappearing into the distance with Helmepo in tow. What? Who agreed? Hey, wait, Zara shouted after Luffy, but it was futile. Is he really going to break into the marine base? Aren't you going to stop him? Zara turned to Logan, suddenly concerned. That's the marine base. Breaking in means certain death, Zara reminded urgently. Logan grinned. You seem to care a lot for your crew. Crew? Zara protested. Hey, don't label me like that. I can't be crews with pirates. If you don't stop him, you won't have captain. Ah. Worried about your own captain, huh? Logan chuckled, patting Zara on the shoulder. I get your worry. I'll go check it out. Despite Luffy's strength, Logan thought it best to handle the matter of breaking into the marine base alone. Having him there would at least ensure Luffy's safety. Soon, amidst Helmepo's protests, the two vanished through the front gate. Huh? Luffy and Logan broke in. Kobe, seemingly taken aback, voiced his surprise. Zara nodded with a sigh. Yeah. Those two are causing a ruckus as usual. Upon witnessing Kobe's actions, he promptly cautioned, If you undo my restraints, you'll meet the same fate. Struggling, Kobe's countenance tightened as he persisted in untying the rope. Through gritted teeth, he uttered, They've no grounds to detain you. I can't stand seeing the Marines act this way. In the future, I must embody the dream of an honorable Marine, just as Luffy aspires to find One Piece. What? One Piece? Are you serious? Zara's expression twisted in disbelief. Boom. In that instant, a bullet swiftly pierced through Kobe. What? With a cry, Kobe collapsed to the ground. How dare you defy Captain Morgan's orders and attempt to rescue the pirate hunter? Several marine soldiers emerged from a nearby door, brandished their weapons at the three individuals left at the execution site. Ah. I've been shot. I'm bleeding. Am I going to die? Kobe lay on the ground hand soaked in blood, wearing a look of utter despair. You're still alive. Zora was left speechless, this person seemed excessively timid. Suddenly realizing something, he turned away, shouting to Kobe, get up and escape with her. Escape? Captain Morgan is already aware of this situation. None of you should stay here. Even this little girl. The marines admonished. Big brother, let me untie the rope for you. The young girl lacked a precise understanding of the danger. Her only focus was on rescuing her older brother, ignorant of the risk involved. Stop. That's a serious offense. A marine soldier yelled, aiming the gun at the little girl. Observing the girl's attempt, Zara shouted, No, they'll shoot. Nevertheless, the little girl showed no intention of halting. 
Her small hand had already gripped the knot. Ka 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 ka. The distinct sound of the safety locks being released resonated. The barrel of the gun was now directed at the little girl's back, a menacing black hole waiting. Ah, give me the sword. Zora, gripped by urgency, shouted at Kobe. Sword. Sword. In a state of confusion, Kobe's thoughts raced. Subconsciously, he extended his hand and brushed against the scabbard of a fallen marine soldier nearby. Sword. Sword. Ah, Tilda? I can use a sword too. Damn it. How dare you defy Captain Morgan's orders. We can't even tolerate a little girl, otherwise, Captain Morgan will have us killed. One final warning. This isn't good. I need to save her. Ignoring the pain from the gunshot, Kobe's face displayed intense anxiety. Breathe, breathe, yes, Master taught me. Breath of thunder. Stubborn, shoot, comma. After two warnings, a marine soldier clenched his teeth and commanded. But in that very moment. Whoosh. A streak of blinding white light tilde. Like lightning breaching the barrier. Bang 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 bang. Several marine soldiers lost consciousness before they could comprehend what had occurred. Chapter 18. Chapter 18. Bang 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 bang. Zora stood in dumbfounded shock as the marine soldiers collapsed to the ground. His gaping mouth nearly reached the floor. After a while, he gazed at Kobe in disbelief. You. You're a formidable swordsman. Moments ago, he had regarded Kobe as overly timid. But in the blink of an eye, Kobe revealed his true prowess. Huh. Kobe panted heavily, sweat pouring down. Yesterday, in the world of, Demon Slayer, Zenitsu, he had practiced the Breath of Thunder with Jigoro Kawajima. Despite not yet mastering the fundamental technique, his current grasp of Thunder's breath proved more than sufficient to handle a few marine soldiers. Me? Kobe winced as he approached, his face drained of color. While using the sword to free Zora, he explained, truth be told, I'm a useless fool. If I hadn't crossed paths with Logan and Luffy, I might have remained a slave to someone else forever. Having this kind of strength would have been even more unimaginable. Slave, Zora was puzzled. Kobe nodded, yes. Just yesterday, I was a handyman on Alveda's ship, trapped with no chance of escape. It was Logan and Luffy who rescued me. Pirates saving lives. The notion struck a chord in Zora's heart. Over the years, he had encountered countless pirates, each more nefarious than the last. But a saving pirate. A concept he hadn't encountered before. Is this really a reality? Why not utilize your incredible swordsmanship skills to escape? Zora couldn't fathom the lightning-fast lethal move Kobe had just executed. You're so powerful, yet you're content being subservient to others. Even if you can't defeat Alveda, wouldn't finding an opportunity to flee be straightforward? No. Didn't I just mention that? I began learning swordsmanship only after being rescued by Logan yesterday. What? Zora's eyes widened. You've just begun learning swordsmanship yesterday, and you've already at this level? Every move he made emitted sparks and lightning. What kind of uncanny talent was this? No. You mean, you just started learning swordsmanship yesterday? Zora, feeling perplexed, asked again. Kobe nodded, affirming, yes. I learnt it from a manga book created by Logan. A manga book? Zora was incredulous. What do you mean, manga books, regarding swordsmanship? Oh, right. I was as shocked as you are, Kobe replied. Logan is a manga artist who possesses the manga manga fruit. His drawn manga can be entered, and I acquired this swordsmanship from one of those worlds. Upon hearing Kobe's explanation, Zora's breathing quickened. Devil fruit. Although he'd never seen one, he'd certainly heard of it. If it's due to the devil fruit, then any sort of magic seems plausible. I see. Kobe glanced at Zoro and continued, If you also wish to enter the manga world to master swordsmanship, you could join their pirate crew. Logan is incredibly kind. He helped a destitute fellow like me, I'm sure he'd be willing to help you too. Entering the manga world to learn swordsmanship, Zoro was genuinely thrilled. Huh? What just happened here? Logan's voice snapped Zora out of his reverie. Glancing at the extra marine soldiers on the ground and the untied Zora, Logan immediately grasped the situation. Zora gazed at Logan before him. This was the person who had transformed Kobe into a formidable swordsman in just one day. Then, Luffy's exuberant voice cut in between Zora and Logan. Hey, take a look, which one's yours? Luffy held out three sword and inquired. The three sword are all mine. I use a three-sword style, Zoro asserted, moving to claim the sword. 
However, Luffy, not allowing Zora to take them unchallenged, grinned and stated, It's settled. Take the sword, and you're my crew. No Zora reply. Oh, in that case, let's set sail. Luffy nodded solemnly and tugged Logan away. Hey hey hey, my sword. Zora hurried to catch up and grabbed Luffy. What sword? Isn't this my plunder from the marines? Luffy stated seriously, glancing at Logan. Logan nodded, raising his hand. That's correct. It's your spoils. I bear witness. Zora felt disheartened. But. It did seem to be true. He had lost his sword, which he should reclaim from the marines. The sword in Luffy's possession was indeed seized from the marines. What justification did Zora have to demand its return? As he watched the two depart, Zora contemplated. Suddenly, he shouted, Hey, Luffy. I heard you're aiming to become the king of the pirates. Huh? Who leaked that news? Luffy turned, one hand picking his nose. Unbelievable. Picking his nose and then touching my sword. Cough. Cough, Luffy, I meant. Kobe cautiously raised his hand, wearing an apologetic expression. With Luffy's confirmation, Zoro assumed a stance. Hey, future king of the pirates, let's have a fight. Chapter 19, Chapter 19 Hey, future king of the pirates, fight with me. Upon hearing these challenging words, Luffy was instantly invigorated, spinning around abruptly. Without wasting a moment, he hurled the three sword he held directly at Zoro, eagerly asking, I win, and you'll join me? Zora skillfully caught the three sword and reattached them to his belt, treating it with reverence as if it were his beloved wife. Then, the three sword were unsheathed. Engaging in the three swords style, using hands and mouth, Zora raised his head, emitting a fierce fighting spirit. Let's discuss things if you can win. Then it's settled. Luffy grinned and immediately launched a straight punch. Gomu Gomu no pistol. His arm extended like rubber, aiming directly for Zora's chest. Swift as a rabbit, Zora leapt from the ground, narrowly evading the rubber fist. The wind generated by the punch tousled Zora's hood. Closing the gap between them, Zora darted toward Luffy. Nataru, Nagairi, comma. In an instant, Zora wielded the two swords horizontally, dashing at an incredible speed. The glinting blades traced arcs in the air, slashing toward Luffy's waist like scenes from a rapid paced film. Wow! That's incredible! Luffy's eyes widened as he extended his legs and leapt, skillfully evading Zora's strike. Despite his dodge, Luffy remained assertive. Gomu Gomu no Muchi, whip. As the roll concluded, Luffy's rubbery limbs stretched out, aiming to pull Zora closer. Zora countered the blow and swiftly maneuvered, closing the distance with Luffy once more. Well done! Luffy exclaimed, abandoning evasion and instead bellowing loudly. Gomu Gomu no Gatling. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. His fists moved like the wind, raining down relentlessly. The punches were lightning fast, each creating an elongated illusion, as if an onslaught of countless fists were overwhelming Zora in that moment. Mito stream. Zora's vigorous shout accompanied the three blades slicing through the air, methodically countering Luffy's barrage. Santri Uanigiri, comma. The two swords slashed while the third blocked the path of Luffy's escape. Zora's movements were swift, charging towards Luffy's exposed back. Wow. Luffy extended his long arms to grasp the nearby fence, swiftly pulling himself aside. Swish. The lingering wind from Zora's slashes tore through the air. Crash. The wooden cross behind Luffy splintered into three pieces. Wow. That was a close call. Luffy rubbed his arm. Despite his timely reaction, he still felt the impact of Zora's slashing wind. No bloodshed but a tingling sensation lingered in his feet. Awesome. You managed to evade my anagiri. I'm starting to recognize your strength, Zora declared, exerting his strength. Irrespective of whether Zora was exceptionally strong, each of his moves carried immense force. Incredible. Now that the warm-up's done, I'm getting serious, Luffy affirmed, ready to give his all. Luffy shook his arms and approached Zora confidently. Over? You're calling what just happened a warm-up? Zora spun around, incredulous. Are you kidding me? You still have that much strength left? Yes. Luffy replied with a smirk, stepping forward. What? Logan, observing the battle, widened his eyes in shock and muttered, No way. Isn't this move? Curious, he heard Luffy shout, Gear change. Second gear. Comma. Puff. Logan coughed out an old gulp. What on earth? What's happening? As a dedicated manga fan, Logan distinctly remembered that Luffy first utilized the second gear during the NI's lobby battle. But where was this happening now? Is this really the second gear? 
Taking a deep breath, Logan tried to comprehend the situation. Could it be? The world's version of Luffy was drained earlier? Even though Logan couldn't quite grasp the situation, upon reflection, wasn't this a fortunate turn of events? If Luffy's advancements began earlier, then he could progress more steadily toward the climax. With a loud yell from Luffy, steam billowed out of his body, and his skin turned a fiery red. The momentum of Luffy surged dramatically, transforming him into an entirely different persona. Just a warm-up earlier, Zoro wiped the remaining sweat from his face, eyes wide with astonishment as he observed Luffy. Facing the previous version of Luffy, Zoro hadn't sensed much. But now, he felt as though he stood before a fierce, unleashed beast, ready to explode with tremendous force at any moment. There was an unmistakable aura of strength emanating from Luffy, only seen in the mighty. My strength now is not what it was before. I'm about to get serious. You better brace yourself for this strike, Luffy announced, rubbing his fists together, assuming a stance like a released beast. As he lifted his head, the gleam in his eyes was razor sharp. All right. The stronger you are, the more I relish it. Such battles are the most thrilling. Zoro clenched his teeth, tightly gripping the two sword, focusing all his attention on the impending clash. Santra Toragari. Engage. Zoran unleashed his mightiest blows yet, the two sword lights slashing through the sky. If you're a monster, then I'm the monster hunter. Toragari. Sword light and shadow intertwined in a chilling display. Zoro aimed for Luffy's silhouette. But. Reality often veers from the ideal. Whoosh. With the speed surge from the second gear, Luffy left only an after image for Zoro and leapt into the air. Gomu Gomu no Jet Bazooka. Boom. Before the sound echoed, Luffy's attack struck. Zoro sensed it but had no time to counter. A resounding crash. Chapter 20. Chapter 20. On the cracked ground, Zoro lay sprawled, leaving behind a visible mark. Will you be my crew this time? Luffy approached, extending a friendly hand to Zoro. Wait. I haven't lost yet. Among the fishes on the ground, Zoro didn't accept Luffy's hand. Gritting his teeth, he staggered to his feet. His gaze remained resolute. Come on, let's fight again. Hey Tilda? Observing Zoro's bruised face, Luffy scratched his head, shaking it. No need I'm in second gear now, and my moves are entirely overwhelming. If you couldn't block my last strike, another round won't change the outcome. The gap between Luffy in the second gear and his earlier self was substantial. Unable to halt a single blow. Infuriating. How can I, Zoro, be this weak? Desire for strength fueled Zoro. Clutching his two sword, he shouted, I can still fight. He lifted his foot, retrieved the third sword from the ground, and clenched it between his teeth. Don't fight, don't fight Tilda Luffy shook his head emphatically. You can't continue like this. I believe the winner is clear. Why persist? No, Luffy, keep fighting him. At that moment, Logan's voice caught Luffy's attention. What? Luffy was intrigued, gazing at Logan in confusion. But he can't handle my attacks anymore. If you call it off now, isn't that risking ending someone's fight? Logan's tone grew serious. He looked at Luffy intently. Remember, never dismiss a heart that yearns to grow stronger. Initially, Logan intended to let events unfold naturally and follow the storyline. However, observing the clash between Zoro and Luffy, he sensed something amiss. In this moment, Luffy and Zoro had just met, unaware of each other's personalities. But as a time traveler, Logan understood each individual's nature. If Luffy declined Zoro's continued challenge today, it might lead to discord between them. If Zoro wasn't part of this crew, could it rightfully be called the Straw Hat Pirates? No, it couldn't. Luffy, engage him in a fight. Logan's demeanor turned serious as he pointed at Zoro, urging Luffy on. Never dismiss a strong heart. Fight him, yes. Understanding the significance, Zoro gratefully nodded at Logan. His eyes sharpened, fixed on Luffy. Come on, let's fight again. Driven by those words, Zoro's emotions surged, his entire being ablaze with fighting spirit. All right, understood. Despite his usual carefree demeanor, Luffy sensed the fervor Zoro sought in this moment. It wasn't just about fighting, it was about perseverance. As a sign of respect, Zoro, I won't hold back. The question of Kraship momentarily faded, Luffy now saw only a rival in Zoro's eyes. As Luffy unleashed his Gomu Gomu no twin jet pistol, dash, Zoro braced himself and miraculously managed to block the onslaught. He crossed his swords, using the flat sides to intercept Luffy's fists. Boom. 
An earth-shattering collision followed, exerting immense force onto the blades. In the next moment, disaster struck, the sword shattered under the overwhelming impact. The aftermath of Luffy's assault hit Zoro directly. Boom. Zoro was propelled like a cannonball, crashing into a distant wall. Sliding along it, he slumped into a corner, the area descending into an eerie silence. Kobe's eyes widened in horror, while the young girl covered her mouth in shock, unable to utter a word. Logan's gaze narrowed, his mind racing with thoughts. Standing still, fists clenched, Luffy gazed earnestly at Zoro, breaking the silence after a while. It's over. But in that very moment, Zoro, who appeared lifeless, defiantly lifted one arm and retrieved the sword from his mouth. This simple movement seemed to drain his last ounce of strength. He pressed the tip of the sword against the ground, the arm holding it trembling with effort. Clearly, Zoro was exerting every ounce of effort to rise again. You! Even Luffy was stunned by this determination. Logan breathed deeply, emotions stirring within him. The man before him. There were so many memorable moments, especially the resolute phrase uttered at Thriller Bark, still vivid in Logan's memory. As the why Zora persisted, Logan could only say, that's just Zora. I, I haven't lost yet. This time, Zora gripped the handle of the Wado Yakumanji sword with both hands, straining as if he was borrowing life itself to stand once more. Clearly unable to fight any longer, he even needed the support of the sword just to stand upright. I have a question. Luffy calmly looked at Zora, prompting him to speak. Speaking at this moment was excruciatingly difficult for Zora. His mouth moved slightly, signal Luffy to continue. What keeps you going? Had it been any other question, Zora might have refrained from speaking. But this question. Enduring intense pain, Zora lowered his head, gazing at the sword Wado Yakumanji in his hand, displaying a resolute smile. Because I once made a promise to someone. I promised her that I would become the world's greatest swordsman. As he spoke, Zora seemed to drift back to a few years ago. Under the starlit sky, the girl sat beside him, clutching her knees, tearfully expressing her longing, I envy you being a boy. I also want to become the world's greatest swordsman. Now that she was gone, he held onto her sword. It carried her dream. I promised her that until I fulfill that promise, I... With a heavy sigh, Zora's face grew paler, almost devoid of color, yet he still bellowed desperately with all his might, will never, fall. Chapter 21, Chapter 21 Zora's charisma was what drew Logan to admire Zora through the actions depicted in the mangas. But witnessing this, his determination, his willpower, his, Logan clenched his fist. This, what kind of true man is this? Zora, join my crew. Luffy didn't utter another word, but reached out and grabbed Zora's hand. Zora remained silent. The earlier shout had drained every ounce of his strength. At that moment, he could barely summon the energy to breathe. Boom. Zora slumped unconscious onto Luffy's arms. Thud, thud, thud. The synchronized sound of boots hitting the ground echoed as a sizable group of marine soldiers stormed into the square, encircling Logan and the others. Stand behind me. Kobe pulled the little girl protectively behind him, emboldened by the previous shot he fired. Don't move, hands up. Marines aimed their guns at Luffy, Logan, and Kobe, shouting loudly in unison. Then, the soldiers parted, allowing a tall, robust man to step forward from the midst, a man with an axe replacing the lower part of his right forearm. Captain. Captain. The Marine soldiers showed a mix of reverence and fear upon seeing Morgan. Just a few troublemakers, and you disrupt my affairs in person? Morgan's presence was imposing. Reaching the front, he noticed several soldiers lying on the ground. Infuriated, he bellowed, bring them here, execute all these men on the ground. Ah, Tilda? T they are, Marines. Captain. The Marine soldiers surrounding Morgan reacted with shocked exclamations. A chilling aura emanated from Morgan's demeanor, his lips curled slightly as he spoke with icy eyes. Captain Morgan, has no use for subordinates who are worthless. Fire. Morgan's fierce gaze fixed on the marines by his side. These soldiers, sensing the suffocating atmosphere, hastily raised their guns, pointing them at their fellow marines on the ground. Get lost. But then, Luffy's thunderous roar reverberated through the square, shaking the very ground Morgan stand. Nanny? Morgan's expression contorted fiercely, he rubbed his ears incredulously slowly turning to face Luffy, his tone arrogant. Did you just tell me, Captain Morgan, to get lost? Hiss. 
Marine soldiers collectively gasped, looking at Luffy as if he were a monster. To dare speak such words to Captain Morgan. It's madness. They expected Morgan to strike Luffy down in an instant. Yet, before that could happen, a sharp, thunderous slap resounded through the air. Clap. Morgan's expression of invincibility shattered instantly under the unexpected slap, an expression of wide-eyed disbelief replaced his arrogant demeanor. As Morgan glanced up, he saw a figure standing before him. You heard that loud and clear now. It wasn't Luffy confronting Morgan, but, it was Logan. Despite lacking direct offensive capabilities, his speed and defensive skills were formidable. Within a small region like East Blue, he possessed certain unscrupulous advantages. Suddenly, the atmosphere shifted from Zora's inspirational persistence to the absurd display by Morgan. His actions were irritating, resembling someone who intentionally portrayed ignorance. The act of pretending, when not needed, was infuriating. What? Morgan had spun, shaking off the dizziness, finally regaining clear vision without double images. When he focused on Logan before him, rage boiled within him. You fool. You're asking for death. A ferocious expression emerged on Morgan's muscled face. He swung his right arm, the sharp axe glinting menacingly under the sunlight. Intent on severing Logan's head in one swift strike, punishment fitting for anyone daring to defy Morgan. And this individual had the audacity to slap him. Die. Die, damn it. Swish. The razor-sharp axe sliced through the air, aimed directly at Logan's head. Logan. Logan. Almost simultaneously, Luffy and Kobe shouted out loud. In a split second, one of Luffy's arms extended rapidly, trying to seize hold of Logan and violently pulling him backward. Kobe rushed forward, attempting to rescue Logan. Confronted with Morgan Axe, Logan remained remarkably composed, almost finding it amusing. As he raised his head, he considered catching the axe barehanded. After all, his defensive capabilities were formidable. Though untested, Logan estimated his defense to be on par with Big Mom's steel bone. Swoosh. Before Logan's hand could catch the axe blade, he felt a rush of wind on both sides and suddenly found himself standing beside Luffy. Wipe. Logan was somewhat bewildered. He intended to to defense but was kindly pulled back by Luffy. Hold on to Zora and protect him. Luffy thrust Zora into Logan's arms and leap up. Logan preferred to lie back and watch his captain's performance quietly. Morgan swung the axe down onto the ground, creating an explosive effect with scattered gravel, yet he staggered and fell himself, looking rather pathetic. Asshole. His lips quivered with anger as he struggled to rise, but suddenly, he noticed another looming shadow overhead. What's happening? It's a sunny day, where's this shade coming from? Subconsciously, Morgan gazed up at the sky. Huh? What's this? Something huge obstructed the sunlight, yet from his angle, he couldn't discern the whole image. However, his ears could unmistakably catch Luffy's bellow from above. Hone Fuse and Bone Balloon Chapter 22, Chapter 22 With a puff, Logan sipped his salt soda and sprayed it all over Zora's face. What on earth? Third gear. Luffy just arrived at Shell's town, and not only the second gear but now the third gear too? Luffy's power are way too grand. Perfect. The bigger the power, the better my spot for lounging. At this rate, could we expect to see the fifth gear before reaching Sabadi Archipelago? Imagine the spectacle when Kizaru makes his descent. Visualizing Kizaru's ostentatious entrance, Logan thought he deserved a good thrashing. When the time comes, our Luffy will show you what real terror is. Gomu Gomu no Gigant Pistol, comma. Midair, Luffy bit his finger and blew a bone balloon. Then, with a fist descending from the sky, he slammed it down with a resounding crash. Boom. The ground of Shell's town seemed to quake. Many young girls walking nearby were shaken and fell to the ground, their skirts fluttering. At the marine base square, the earth roared and the ground splintered. After the dust settled, Morgan lay amidst the rubble, broken and battered, even his broad axe gone. Wow. That was incredible. Kobe's eyes widened, as if he had witnessed a monster, his eyeballs nearly popping out. Luffy landed on the ground, his oversized fist returning to its normal size, his expression unusually serious. He cast a cold glance at the marine soldiers around him and questioned, anyone else want to try? The soldiers exchanged looks, their expressions transforming from initial shock to excitement. Amazing. Captain Morgan is defeated. This guy's rule is over. Liberation. To Luffy's surprise, instead of continuing the fight, 
The Marines cheered excitedly. They discarded their weapons, exuding genuine relief and joy. Hey, what's happening? Why are they so happy now that the captain is down? Luffy was completely caught off guard. Logan smiled and clarified, clearly, from the fear these soldiers showed towards Morgan earlier, it's evident they've endured Morgan reign for a long time, forced to serve as his minions. Now that Morgan is defeated, they can finally be true marines again. Ah, I see, Luffy scratched his head, seeming to understand. Forget that, we need to find a doctor for Zora, Logan reminded, helping Zora outside. I'll take care of it, Luffy volunteered, hoisting Zora over his shoulder with one arm like a rope. A few days later. At the port of Shell's town. Big brother, take care. With tears in her eyes, little girl held onto Zora's hand tightly. At this point, Zora's injuries had almost healed. Normally, with such severe wounds, recovery would have taken around a hundred days. Logan had seen Zora's incredible physique in manga before, but witnessing it firsthand made him realize that Zora was indeed a powerhouse. It felt almost surreal to praise such a formidable figure. Though a few ribs were broken, they'd heal in a matter of days. Would you have believed it without seeing it yourself? Well, thanks for the rice ball. Next time I visit, could you make more for me? Zora squatted, displaying both his rugged and compassionate sides as he patted the little girl head. With a striking silhouette, Zora strode to the ship's side and ascended to the deck. Luffy. Logan. As the pirate ship departed from the port, Kobe rushed over and called out. Hey there, Kobe. You made it, Luffy grinned, seemingly expecting Kobe's arrival. Logan waved at Kobe. Hi. From your attire, I guess you finally fulfilled your wish to become a marine, right? Kobe exclaimed, yes. I'm sorry I'm late. I sneaked out just to bid you farewell sneaked out? Are you sure? Logan grinned, lifting his right index finger and gesturing towards the area behind Kobe. Perplexed, Kobe didn't understand Logan's signal but instinctively turned around to see what was behind him. To Kobe's surprise, there stood a row of neatly arranged marine soldiers on the port behind him. What? Kobe was taken aback. Oh no, oh no, Kobe muttered to himself, feeling disheartened. I finally joined the marines. And now, sneaking out to bid farewell to the pirates, I've been caught. It's the end of my marine dream. However, just when Kobe was about to lose hope, the officer of the marine's voice boomed across the port. All. Attention. Salute. All the marines snapped to attention and saluted. Huh? Kobe was momentarily surprised, but quickly grasped the situation. He turned towards Logan and Luffy, saluting them in return. Logan and Luffy acknowledged it with a nod and responded with a hand gesture to the marines. Chapter 23, Chapter 23 The pirate ship had departed from Shell's town. This guy's reading mangas? Zora couldn't help but wonder aloud. Manga, wait a minute, I think I remember something. Kobe mentioned this to me before. Zora suddenly recalled what Kobe had told him earlier. Logan's manga can transport you into the manga world, Kobe had mentioned and Kobe learned incredible swordsmanship with sparks and lightning from one of those mangas. Observing Luffy heading to read manga right after extracting his belongings, Zora became even more suspicious. Leaning in with doubts, Zora questioned, You. Can you actually enter the manga? Luffy was just about to activate his spirit to enter the manga world when Zora's sudden inquiry disrupted the process. Oh, yeah, Luffy nodded, but then asked in surprise, Hey, how did you know? I heard from Kobe. He said that Logan possesses a devil fruit ability related to manga, enabling entry into the manga's world. Is that true? Zora recounted what Kobe had mentioned. That's right. It's true, Luffy affirmed, nodding. Then, a thought struck him, by the way, I felt a bit embarrassed about our previous battle. These words triggered an explosion from Zora. Hey, there's a limit to underestimating someone. If you lose, you lose, if you win, you win. I'm not the type to argue just for the sake of it. No. Luffy shook his head. If I had met you a few days ago, I wouldn't have easily defeated you. Remember the strength I had when we first fought at the Marine Base Square? I remember. We were evenly matched then. But after you activated your second gear, I couldn't keep up. Wait. Are you saying you learned that second gear move from mangas? Zora suddenly remembered Kobe mentioning learning swordsmanship from mangas. Not exactly, Luffy replied, gesturing with a finger but I owe the mangas for enabling me to develop the second gear quickly. Failing repeatedly in that manga world pushed me to strive harder, ultimately leading to the development of the second and third gears. 
So, without those mangas, it's hard to predict who would have won our battle that day, Luffy stated calmly. He's not someone who's concerned about saving face. By the way, have you visited Logan yet? Go and ask for a copy. As a swordsman, learning more about swordsmanship would be beneficial, Luffy suggested. Can I do that too? Hearing this, Zoro felt a rush of emotions. His breathing became faster involuntarily. For someone like him. The aspiration to grow stronger was his dream. What was this feeling? Luffy stood up, speaking earnestly, hey. Of course, we're crewmates. Crew. Accustomed to being alone for so long, Zoro seemed to have grown accustomed to acting independently. However, when he heard Luffy affectionately call him crew, he couldn't help but feel touched. Crew. Yes. From now on, you're my captain. Once recognized, last a lifetime. Without delay, Zora didn't hinder Luffy's entrance into the manga and instead went to Logan's studio as his crew. Inside the cabin. Zora, come in and have a seat, Logan paused his paintbrush, extending a warm invitation. Except for a certain captain coming to ransack the place, everyone else was welcome in Logan's studio. Zora stepped into the studio and was greeted by a bookshelf packed with manga. It left him breathless. Were all of these mangas that lead into other worlds? Logan's talent truly amazed him. Deciding to cut straight to the point, Zoro addressed Logan, Logan, I'd like to request a manga focusing on swordsmanship. Would that be possible? Reading manga? Logan appeared slightly surprised. Shouldn't this guy spend all his spare time on cultivation? Why the sudden interest in manga? Could it be due to Luffy's influence? But, a manga about swordsmanship? That seemed plausible. It could expose Zora to the majestic skills of powerful swordsmen in alternate worlds, a potentially great idea. After a moment's contemplation, Logan headed to the manga bookshelf and searched through it. Selecting a particular volume, he handed it to Zora, saying, Here, take this manga. The swordsman depicted within possesses remarkable skills. I hope you find it insightful. Even the manga's creator acknowledged the exceptional swordsmanship depicted within. Zora felt a surge of excitement. All right. I won't disappoint you. Accepting the manga eagerly, Zora glanced at the cover. Biography of Kojiro Sasaki- Dash. Chapter 24, Chapter 24 On the deck, Luffy sat at one end while Zora occupied the other, engrossed in the manga he had opened. The story unfolded in a mountain garden. Beneath a banyan tree sat a striking young boy with a twig in his mouth. He sported a dark blue ponytail. A lavender headband, a dark purple sleeveless waistcoat over a purple kimono, wristbands tied in purple around his wrists, and straw sandals on his feet. The boy skillfully wielded a long sword, continuously chopping piles of wooden golems. Behind him stood a scruffy-looking old man, watching the boy with a broad smile. This cut is off by half an inch, the old man remarked. This one's improved, just one centimeter off. Oh, Sasaki, you missed your mark with that cut just now? This cut is nearly perfect again. Each time Sasaki Kojira made a stroke, the old man provided precise feedback on the accuracy of his cuts. The wooden golem stakes had a red mark, a thin line representing the target Sasaki Kojiro aimed to strike. Despite the sweat on his young face, Sasaki Kojiro displayed unwavering determination as he focused on chopping the wooden golem piles, aiming at the marked red line. Day by day, Sasaki Kojiro diligently continued this practice never wavering from the target. His cutting errors progressively diminished. Zoro found himself captivated by the scene of the boy chopping the wooden gillum piles, compelling him to scroll down further. In the blink of an eye, the boy had transformed into a youth. He now possessed a tall, imposing figure and a handsome appearance, if not for the long sword in his arms, nobody would have guessed he was a swordsman. Raised in a tumultuous era, Sasaki Kojiro had to engage in daily battles with swords and blades to survive. Under such circumstances, ordinary individuals would easily succumb to a brutal and merciless mindset. However, Sasaki Kojiro displayed none of the signs of madness often associated with warriors. Instead, he exhibited refined habits such as admiring the moon, savoring tea, and reciting poetry. When not wielding a blade, he seemed to embody elegance itself. Initially, Zora struggled to comprehend Sasaki Kojiro's behavior. He believed a swordsman should remain focused on combat, questioning why one should appreciate the aesthetics of life. But as he delved further into the story, Zoro realized his misconception. In the following pages, Kojiro Sasaki encountered his first formidable adversary. The battles were evenly matched, each side attacking and defending with equal fervor. 
the encounters resulted in severe injuries, both parties sustaining deep wounds. Amidst the fierce combat, as both sides neared exhaustion, the opponent adopted an aggressive, all-out attack strategy, seemingly aiming for a mutual killing blow. This reckless approach significantly increased the chances of victory in such a dire situation. However, a gust of mountain wind unraveled the opponent's hair bun, revealing a sense of elegance. Meanwhile, Sasaki Kojiro, wielding a five-foot-long sword, remained composed and collected, as if calmly enjoying the moonlight and sipping tea in his own tranquil courtyard, showing no hint of panic. Effortlessly maneuvering through the courtyard, he skillfully deflected the opponent's frenzied strikes one by one. Amid the opponent's increasing bewilderment, Sasaki Kojiro's graceful sword stroke elegantly crossed the opponent's neck, ending the battle. With a resounding clang, he sheathed his sword, standing tall and straight like a towering pine tree. Amidst the moonlit mountains, a solitary figure remained in the chilling glow. Retrieving a wine jug from his waist, he uncorked it and nonchalantly tossed the cork away. Such a leisurely demeanor. At this moment, Zora comprehended it. Sasaki Kojiro wasn't like those pretentious individuals who merely pretended to appreciate artistry. He had seamlessly integrated the path of elegance into his own style of swordsmanship. As the story in the manga progressed, Sasaki Kojiro had already mastered the art of swordsmanship, no longer needing to engage in daily battles because most of his adversaries had perished. In his routine, mornings involved practicing with his wooden sword, chopping wooden golem steaks. At noon, he savored tea while basking in the sunlight. By sunset, he enjoyed wine, appreciated the moon, and recited poetry. As Zora neared the end of the manga, a sudden realization struck him. Wait a minute? You mentioned I could enter the manga. Why have I nearly finished reading it and still haven't entered? Zora questioned himself. Almost instantaneously, the familiar scent of the sea breeze vanished, replaced by the fragrance of a damp mountain forest, carried by the moist wind laden with rain and dew, a sensation that brought relaxation and contentment. Curiously, Kojiro Sasaki ceased his chopping of wooden gillum piles, turning to observe the stranger who had suddenly appeared in his yard. Are you lost, young man? Sasaki Kojiro inquired. Lost? Zora? That was preposterous. I, Zora, never get lost. Zora was about to erupt in anger, almost as a reflex. However, just as the surge of fury welled within him. Hey? Zora exclaimed, widening his eyes as he took in his surroundings, realizing he had somehow entered the world depicted in the manga. Senior Sasaki Kojiro, Zora subconsciously addressed the middle-aged man before him. Senior? Sasaki Kojiro regarded Zora calmly, his profound gaze seemingly gauging Zora's strength almost instantly. Shaking his head, Kojiro remarked, Young man, if you're here to challenge me, it's too soon. Despite Sasaki Kojiro's past, he wasn't someone who took lives indiscriminately. No, senior. I want to learn swordsmanship from you, Zora blurted out abruptly, a departure from his usual character. His perception of characters in mangas, influenced by Luffy and Kobe, led him to believe that the manga world was a place to learn art. Thus, he expressed his thoughts without any preamble. As he gazed at the young man who had wandered into his courtyard, he was reminded of his own teenage years when he encountered an elderly swordmaster by chance. This encounter set him on the path of swordsmanship. Despite the old master leaving abruptly after a month, he imparted the graceful technique of chopping wooden gillum piles and the ways of a swordsman, Zora's sole teacher in life. In this moment, facing the young man who had intruded into his courtyard, Sasaki Kojiro felt a sense of deja vu, as if looking at another version of himself from a different time. Come, try your hand at cutting a wooden gillum pile, Kojiro said casually, flicking the wooden sword towards Zora in a perfectly executed curve. Chapter 25, Chapter 25 Zora gripped the wooden sword and approached the wooden gillum pile. With both hands firmly on the wooden sword, he slashed down onto the pile. Swish! The wooden gillum pile exploded into pieces. Zora turned towards Sasaki Kojiro. Senior, I've been practicing swordsmanship since a very young age. I believe I've mastered the basics, Zora remarked confidently. Sasaki Kojiro didn't respond verbally. Instead, he calmly walked over to the sword dressed and selected another wooden sword. Young man, I've now adjusted my strength to match yours, Kojiro said calmly, positioning the wooden sword at a 45 degree angle to the ground, resembling a figure in a tranquil painting. All right. Let's do it. Zora eagerly welcomed the opportunity to face such a formidable senior. In the world of pirates, combat was the path to strength, and this opponent presented an excellent challenge. 
Senior, prepare yourself. Zoro initiated the stance, placing the wooden sword at his waist. With a fierce glint in his eyes, he declared, One Sword's style Lion Song. In an instant, Zoro vanished from his position, executing an incredibly swift sword drawing maneuver designed to appear behind the opponent as the sword is drawn. An efficient end to the battle. However. Snap. The wooden sword slipped from Sasaki Kojiro's hand. Zoro felt a dizzying sensation, collapsing to the ground. What a swift sword, he muttered, modeling a bump on his forehead. Once more, Sasaki Kojiro offered Zoro the fallen wooden sword. Absolutely, Zoro responded enthusiastically. Battles always excited him. Zoro grabbed the sword once more, adopting a stance, and charged forward again. Snap. Azora tumbled to the ground, rubbing his forehead. The first bump had grown larger, but no second bump appeared. Again, Sasaki Kojiro's response remained unchanged. Picking up another wooden sword from the rack, Zoro contemplated his strategy. He then readied himself. Nuturu, Nagairi. Snap. Azora fell again, patting his forehead in pain. Ouch. This time the blow hit the same spot, causing more agony than before. Why? How? Despite comprehending the opponent's strategy after the first two encounters, Zoro was confounded by the repetitive blows targeting the same vulnerable spot. Again, echoed Sasaki Kojiro's calm voice. He remained rooted in the same position throughout the exchanges. Frustration welled within Zoro. Why couldn't he make the opponent budge, even with the level playing field? If the opponent unleashed their full strength, Zoro wouldn't mind. But this consistent one-sided dominance, despite matching their level, was intolerable to him. Zoro, feeling increasingly frustrated compared to his previous fights, couldn't accept the ongoing situation. Impossible. Even with vast combat experience, using the same technique flawlessly repeatedly is implausible, Zoro reasoned. He returned to the sword rack and selected another wooden sword. Perceiving his actions, Sasaki Kojiro frowned slightly. What's your plan? he inquired. In truth, I am a three-sword swordsman, Zoro declared, placing the wooden sword between his teeth. Slightly hesitant, Kojiro replied, come again. This time it'll be different. Zoro determinedly gripped the dual sword, showcasing an impressive burst of muscular power. With swift movement, he raised both sabers above his head, launching an unrivaled assault towards Kojiro Sasaki. Santru, Toragari, comma. Zoro's attack, akin to a tiger's fierce leap, struck with incredible speed. Observing the opponent's attacks thrice earlier, Zoro had adduced the vulnerability lay on the left side due to Kojiro wielding the sword in his right hand. Thus, Zoro aimed his strike towards Kojiro's left. Snap. Stunned, Zoro lay on the ground, bewildered. How was this possible? Despite identifying the loophole, Kojiro's attack landed precisely on the bulging spot on his head. He touched the bulge in disbelief. Impossible. How can someone execute the same strike multiple times without losing accuracy? Despite being directionally challenged, Zoro was a prodigy in swordsmanship. Unable to discern where he erred, he realized that despite repeated moves, Kojiro's accuracy remained unwavering. This made it impossible to exploit any mistakes. Wherever Zoro faltered, Kojiro consistently dominated their encounters with unerring strikes. As a result of his repeated defeats, Zoro made a resolute decision. I won't be fighting again, Zora stated firmly, shaking his head. He had come to a realization, no matter how many times he challenged Sasaki Kojiro, he couldn't decipher the secrets behind Kojiro's swordsmanship. Each encounter felt like their first, leaving Zoran unable to discern Kojiro's swordplay even after numerous confrontations. Yes, from the first fight to the thousandth, facing Sasaki Kojiro felt consistently new, as if encountering the legendary swordsman for the very first time. Zoro acknowledged this unchanging reality and found no purpose in persisting. Seeing Zoro's refusal, Sasaki Kojiro calmly suggested, let's resume cutting wooden gillum piles then, placing the wooden sword back in its holder before heading towards the house. Zoro acknowledged the decision with a simple acknowledgement. This time, he felt no hint of dissatisfaction. He understood now, the seemingly ordinary chop executed by Sasaki Kojiro was far from ordinary. It encapsulated the essence of Kojiro's daily practice, something Zoro finally comprehended. Observing the wooden gillum pile, Zoro focused on the faint red line in the center, the only mark that intersected the red line on the stake, despite it being split countless times. Sure, splitting the wooden gillum pile in one swift stroke was an impressive display of power. Yet, that raw strength was merely superficial. Anyone could achieve it. However, 
The true demonstration of power lay in the wooden gillum pile's condition after years of splitting. Despite numerous cleaves, only a shallow trace remained, a testament to enduring power, depth, and precision, qualities that transcended brute force. This, to Zora, was the essence of true strength.